Good morning, church. There we go. Man, what a beautiful moment. They didn't tell me I was going to have to follow something like that. How do you follow that? I mean, come on, man. But today is a special day for all the moms and the mom figures out there. So we want to recognize you and just say, let's hear it for the moms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes you can come across a list of names and, you know, maybe you're one of those people, you'll stop and you'll, you'll read the list for whatever reason, but uh, oftentimes you come across a list, whether it's reading in the Bible or somewhere else, and what do we do? We just pass through that list, right? We just glance over that list, or we try to find somebody we know who's on the list. But sometimes a list is way more than just a list of names. Sometimes a collection of names is so much more than a list. There are several sports teams that have large rosters. And if you ask one of the athletes whose name is on the roster, they'll tell you it's more than a list. That those teams can become like family. Every movie ends with a, a roll of credits, names of people who have either been in the movie or who have helped with the movie. And if you ask someone whose name has shown up in the credits, they'll tell you that's more than just a list. There's something special about the connection they've made with others in that process. Uh, we're in the season of graduations where during this season, thousands upon thousands of people will gather in auditoriums and stadiums and on fields and they'll celebrate the graduates and during that time there will be a, a roll call of names a list of names you might have the the program that lists all the names and the accomplishments but if you ask any mama sitting in the stands about those names she'll tell you that is way more than just a list that those are lives that have shaped each other, they have been shared with each other, and that collection of names is way bigger than a list. It's lives that have impacted one another. And when you think about it, each name on each list is more than just a name. It's a person with a story, with a history, with a background whose story has intertwined with the stories of other people who share that list with them. And some collections of names are really more than a list. The Apostle Paul wrote the letter that we know in the New Testament, the, the letter to the Romans or the book of Romans in the New Testament. It's a it's a long book, it, it's heady, it, it deals with deep themes and, and heights of theology. In that, Paul talks to the, the believers in Rome of how all of them and all of us have sinned, how no one is left out of the sin sickness that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he will go on to tell them, but the beautiful thing is that God gives us a free gift of grace that will redeem us if we choose to follow him and surrender to him. Paul talks to the, the people in Rome. He says, you know, your standing is no longer standing in your sin. That's not how God sees you. But if you follow God, then he now sees you as standing in his grace. You are covered in the grace of God. He, he mentions things like how when we were still steeped in our sin, how Christ died for us even then, even when we were still wayward and had our backs turned on God, Jesus died for us to turn our lives around and give us life forever. Paul, the apostle, admits in the letter of the Romans that in chapter seven of how even he wrestles with still his earthly human tendencies, his struggle that pulls him towards sin even though he wants to pursue righteousness. And he's pulled in these two different directions. He, then in Romans eight, talks about how the Spirit of God will move in us to shape us and mold us and, and move us away from those sinful tendencies and move us toward God, but even still, that if our hope is in Jesus, that there is no condemnation for us and nothing will separate us from his love. Paul deals with such mighty themes in the book of Romans. But then, at the end of that letter, after scaling the theological heights, Paul gives us what might seem like a list. It might seem like a list of names, of somewhat strange names from another place, another culture, another time. But Paul lists these names. Romans chapter 16, it says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. It's no mistake that Paul begins his list with a woman. There are 16 people Paul will mention. Six of them are women. Paul's gotten a bad rap through recent 
decades of being a guy who was against women when in fact Paul elevated the place of women in his culture, elevated the place of women in the church. Paul begins his list with Phoebe, with a woman who is a deacon in the church in Sancria. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among all God's people. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many, and especially to me. Paul says, this gal is worthy of honor. Amongst all God's people, she deserves special honor. She's helped me out. She's helped you out. She loves God. She loves you, and she's been a great help. Phoebe, the super servant, the servant leader in the church, first on his list, by no mistake. I'm reminded of gals like Phoebe. One of those gals, a gal named Cindy Lash, I had the joy and the privilege of serving alongside Cindy in ministry for nearly a decade at a previous church where I served. Cindy still serves on staff at that church where she has served for well over 40 years. Uh, Cindy has taken various roles since her beginning there, but for many years she served in women's ministry and in the care ministry. Cindy is a, a fantastic student of God's word. She is led by God's spirit and shaped by God's activity in her life. She is a fantastic teacher of God's word. Cindy led a bunch of women's Bible studies. It'd be kind of weird for a dude like me to walk into a women's Bible study. So instead, in those days, I would stand in the doorway just out of sight, but well within earshot as a student of Cindy's to learn what she would teach. She's a fantastic teacher. I learned so much. She was kind of a staff mom and kind of a mentor to me in a lot of ways. I, I learned so much from her about compassion and care for other people, of conviction, of being surrendered, living surrendered to God and allowing his word to shape and mold. I learned so much from Cindy. She is a woman who deserves special honor. I, I learned of how truth and grace can coexist and both be meted out with extra portion. Ah, Cindy Lash great gal, worthy of special honor. Paul goes on and says, give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. He continues on. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I'm thankful to them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. All the Gentile churches are grateful to them. You know, that's a beautiful thing. As the gospel spread from the Jewish people to the non-Jewish people, people like us, Priscilla and Aquila spearheaded that movement. All those churches, including those of us now, centuries later, have reason to be grateful for them. Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife duo, you couldn't mention one without the other. It just wouldn't seem right. You couldn't talk of one without talking of them as a pair. They are so well connected and have done so much in ministry, so much ministry together, co-workers in the ministry of Jesus. They remind me of, uh, of Charlie and Cleo Lee. Charlie had served on staff for four decades at a church where I once served, and by the time I got there and stepped onto that staff. Charlie had been retired for several years at that point, but Charlie and his wife Cleo were as involved in the ministry and the life of that church as they had ever been. And they met us early on in our time there and they learned that Jen and I were about two hours from both sets of parents, which meant that our kids were about two hours away from both sets of grandparents. And Charlie and Cleo said, well, that's just too far. And they invited us over to their home and they quickly adopted us as their own kids and our kids as their grandkids and we had many moments and meals in their home and they came and shared those moments and meals in our home and they loved on us like we were family. Oh man, Charlie and Cleo. A couple, you, you couldn't talk of one without the other and even in his last days when Charlie was in the hospital just days before the cancer would finally steal his earthly life and allow him to pass into the glorious eternal. We were there in the hospital and Charlie, being the perpetual teacher, was still teaching my kids. And he was even teaching from the original Greek language what certain words meant and what certain concepts meant. And you might think that little kids who were in elementary school or not even yet in school might be bored and check out, but they all hung and clung to those words of Charlie. He just had a way even with the youngest. And I was taking notes as well. I was learning right alongside him. Oh, Charlie and Cleo, servants who 
helped make the church better, who showed us what church actually looks like, that the church isn't a building or an organization, it's the people who love God and serve him. Yeah, people like that. Paul continues his list, says, greet my dear friend Epinetus. He was the first person from the province of Asia to become a follower of Jesus Christ. What an awesome thing. As the gospel spread into Asia, Epinetus grabbed hold of it. The first one. The first one to say, I'm in, I believe, let's go. And then through his example and his influence, it opened the door for many others and the gospel spread into Asia like wildfire. He opened that door for them. Give my greetings, Paul says, to Mary who has worked so hard for your benefit. We know those gals like Mary in the church, don't we? I mean, you can just picture, well, one of those evenings, Paul has finished talking to the group. It's an evening meeting of the church and most of the other people have gone home, everybody, but Paul and Mary are there. Paul's cleaning up, and Mary looks at him and says, Paul, you go on, you get home, I'll take care of this. Paul says, it's late, Mary, I got it, I'll help you. She says, Paul, you gotta, you gotta ride a donkey across Asia to tell people about Jesus tomorrow. You go get some sleep. I'll pick up the cups and the plates. I'll clean up the mess. I'll, I'll get it ready. You, you, just, you just go rest. Mary worked hard for the Lord, for the church. We know people like Mary, don't we? Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews, who were in prison with me. Don't you wish you had the rest of that story? I mean, Paul just kind of says it in passing. Yeah, we were in prison together. By the way, now you know they were in prison for the gospel. They, they were being persecuted, but I know there's some great stories that go along with that. It says they are highly respected among the apostles. Now the apostles had the most respect out of all God's people. And Paul says, but those people who were most respected... Well, they respected Adronicus and Junia. And it says they became followers of Jesus even before I did, Paul says. And Adronicus and Junia, brother-sister duo. I love the brother-sister combination. Siblings who get along and serve the Lord together in great ways. What a beautiful thing. Paul says, greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ. And my dear friend, Stachus. Greet Apelles, a good man whom Christ approves. A good man whom Christ approves. Well, that's worthy of a pause, isn't it? That's like epitaph material right there. That, that's gravestone quote. Oh, to have that said of us when our days are over. A good man, a good woman whom Christ approves. What a beautiful tribute. Those few words say a whole lot about that life, don't they? And give my greetings to the believers from the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet the Lord's people from the household of Narcissus. Give my greetings to Tryphena and Tryphosa. Now you know with names like that, Tryphena, Tryphosa, they had to be twins, right? Those are two female names at that time. And you know these two gals were probably twins. Their parents had fun, Tryphena, Tryphosa. And, but those gals, they grew up and they still looked the same and they still looked like each other when they were in their 30s and 40s. And they would show up to church and they probably showed up at the same time and they probably both wore the blue dress and they probably both sat next to each other on the right side. And you knew that one of them had a mole on her cheek, but you couldn't remember now. Is that Tryphena or is that Tryphosa? But you knew they loved God and they loved his church and they loved people, but you never could quite keep them straight. But they were always there. You know those kinds of people, right? They're always around and they're worthy of being greeted by us. He says they were the Lord's workers. What a noble thing to have said of you. They greet dear Persis who has worked so hard for the Lord right there alongside Mary. And greet Rufus. Rufus, whom the Lord picked out to be his very own, and also his dear mother, who has been a mother to me also. I love that Paul says this. Hey, Rufus, give your mom a hug, and give her another hug for me too, because she's been like my mama also. I mean, you just picture Paul sharing meals with Rufus at his home, his mom making the meal, and Paul eating so many meals there, being with them so often, feeling like that's his home too, like that's his mama, his second mama, and just a beautiful connection there. I, I've been blessed through the years with so many women who have been like a second mom to me. Some of them never able to have children of their own, but they kind of adopted me as a son 
They may have done better adapting than somebody else in, but I was fortunate for that. I, I think of one gal, Luann Kunzman, she was my buddy Brian's mom. Brian was in the group of guys who first invited me to church and surrounded me to love me towards Jesus in those high school days. His mom, Luann, sweet gal, and she loved on me right from the beginning. And Luann, she just had a way of speaking into me when she'd see me stepping into stupid or dabbling in the dumb. She would just look at me and say, Andy, that's what they called me back in those days. In those days. So now, Andy, you know better because you are better. You know better than that because you are better than that. More than 30 years ago, and I still hear her voice when I say those words. You know better than that because you are better than that. And unfortunately, I gave her plenty of reason to say that to me quite often. That's probably why I remember it so well. There was a lot of reason for her to tell me that, but it always stuck with me, always shaped me, always nudged me towards being better. Uh, Luann always made me feel like I belonged. She had the gift of hospitality. Paul writes to the churches and says, be hospitable, open up your hearts, open up your lives, open up your homes and invite people in. Luann was great with that. She always had a place for me in her home, always welcomed me in, and I have an insatiable sweet tooth. We would show up to Brian's house to hang out, and if the sweets weren't already made, there were definitely plenty of them by the time we left. My junior year in high school, I had an accident, punctured my lung. I was in the hospital for uh, several days, and Luann made me some Buckeyes. She knew it was one of my favorite treats. You know those chocolate balls or those peanut butter balls covered in chocolate? Mm, some of you, you're salivating right now with me, right? Peanut butter and chocolate, what God has joined together. Oh, praise him. So Luann made this big platter of these things, brought them to me. Poor Luann didn't realize I was on a liquid diet for the first several days in the hospital. So I sat there and watched everyone else, including my doctors, eat my Buckeyes, it's not cool. But when Luann caught wind of this, she found out when my liquid diet would lift, she came in, she had a whole nother platter of them just for me, she put a note on them, not for sharing, do not share. Oh, I love that woman, she was so sweet and so good. I was like, it's Luann's rule, not mine. In those days, I was running enough, I could eat a whole platter of those and it was okay. You know, Luann just had this way of helping me feel like I belonged long before I believed. In fact, the way that she Gave me a place to belong before I believed, helped move me along in my belief towards Jesus. Her, her model of biblical hospitality ministered to me as a young high school punk, refined some of the punkness off of me and moved me towards Jesus. Gave me a safe place to wrestle with my, my doubts and my fears, my insecurities, my failures, my, my disbelief and unbelief and my desire to believe, but my insurity with all that having a place to belong in a second family like that. And they weren't the only ones. There were several other moms and dads for me in that season of life. Place to belong before I believed. It's pretty special. Paul goes on. He says, get my greetings to a I have gotten that name right for three weeks as I practiced it. A syncret, uh, him. Get my greetings to him. A syncretist. That's it to Asyncritus, to Phlegion, to Hermes, to Petrobus, to Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who meet with them. Give my greetings to Philogus, to Julia, to Nereus, and his sister. I love the brother-sister pair there. To Olympus and all the believers who meet with them. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. Church, be careful of that one. Different culture, different time. Some of you young men like, hey, is that permission? No, it's not, okay? All the churches of Christ send you their greetings. Now, when you see your mama today, you go ahead, give her that sacred kiss. Just right on the cheek. Make sure she knows you love her. Now, at first glance, this is one of those lists with some strange names, and you might not be aware of all the stories, and you just pass right by it, and you think, you know, in your devotion time, that's the kind of thing you skim through or you skip over. It's the kind of passage that guys like me with professions like this say, oh, maybe I won't preach that one. Sure, some of you are thinking, Fitz, is that the most compelling passage you could preach on Mother's Day? The list of names? It, it doesn't appear at first to be one of those places we'd want to park for a bit 
and examine in Scripture. Surely there's something meatier for us somewhere else. But I think if Paul were here with us and we were to look at Paul and we asked Paul, Paul, you, you scaled the heights of theology. You, you plumbed the depths of the depravity of man to show us the redemptive power of God. Man, the book of Romans is like the book of the theological treaties in the New Testament, just the doctrinal things that come out of that. Paul, this is amazing. Why did you end your letter with a list? I think if you ask Paul that, Paul probably look at you, give you kind of a blank stare, cock his head and be like, what? Uh, oh, oh that? Oh, that's not a list. No, that's, that's not a list. Years ago, when Jen and I were first married, I was a high school social studies teacher coached cross country and track and when I left teaching and coaching to go to seminary and be trained for full-time ministry, my athletes made me a, a book, pictures and names and they each wrote notes, some of the notes, not super long, but I tell you, super powerful. I, I think of Adam, Adam Mangle, I flip through the book, see his picture, read his note. Adam attends the church where my wife's family attends. I think of Joel and when I was in seminary, going back to visit Joel because he'd lost his dad, and Joel still loves Jesus and walks with him. I think of Zach, who's become a Christian businessman and a good father, and Bobby, who flies planes for the U.S. Navy. I think of Allison and her sister, who love Jesus, and her sister, who serves in campus ministry now that we got them connected with. I think of Tina and how she loves Jesus with a passion, has become a great mom and a great Christian influence in that community, and on and on it goes. I... I, I go through the whole book that way. I, I come to the end of the book and my buddy Brian, who I coached with and one of my teaching mentors, and I come across, I won't read you his whole letter because I want to make it through, but he come across this part. Continue in your passion for the Lord. Press on in the service of the one who has made us all. May his peace be with you always, Brian. I, I go through the whole book that way. You might look at it, flip through it, and it's pictures and it's a list of names. That's way more than a list. That's stories of lives impacting one another, stories of a reminder of coaching, not just coaching athletes, but coaching them in life, allowing God to speak and work through to shape lives and thinking, man, those kids are no longer kids. They have kids. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> That's not just a list. I'm sure you've got a list like that too. We, we all do. We all have a list. You've got the memory books and the picture books and you've got those people. I think when Paul was writing Romans 16, that was not a list for him. Those were the names of very special people who shaped him and molded him into who he was for God's service. His ministry was marked by those people and their shared stories of serving God together. When Paul wrote to his friends at the church in Philippi, he wrote these words to them, I thank my God every time I remember you. What a beautiful tribute to his friends in that church. What an incredible thing for us to have said of us. I mean, that's one of my prayers for me. It's one of my prayers for you, is that we would all live in such a way that others would thank God every time they remember us. That the end of our days, may that be said of us. I'm convinced as Paul was writing the names and recounting the list in Romans 16, he was doing just this. Thanking God for all those memories. We all have a list like that, don't we? We might not have it written down, but we've got it. Uh, this Mother's Day, I think of some of the gals on my list. There's plenty of dudes I can mention as well. There's plenty of people on that list. I'll spare you from too many, but I think, of course, of my mama. I was fortunate to have a really good mom. She wasn't perfect, and she would tell you that, but I, I had a good mom. She passed a couple years ago, but... I had a really good mom. I know that some of you, you can't say that. You, you don't have that story. And I hurt for those of you in that spot. But 
My mom, really good, not perfect, but a good mom who loved her kids with a deep love. It was a love that was easy to see and easy to understand. We didn't always appreciate it. I think we rarely do until years later, maybe sometimes until it's too late do we really appreciate. You know, a lot I could say about my mom. I just mentioned perhaps the best gift my mom ever gave me was the way she loved my wife as her own daughter. Even before Jen and I were engaged, even before we were married, we started dating my mom. So there's something special about that gal. I said, I know, Mom. I'm trying not to mess it up. <laughs> and my mom just loved on her. And Jen and my mom developed this beautiful, special friendship. And I think, you know, honestly, when I reflect back, I think as the years went on, my mom liked my wife more than she liked me. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. That's, that's not a bad thing. I mean, they had this, to be fair, my mom didn't see my wife grow up, but she had to, like, I was the one who helped make her hair gray. So, you know, there's that. Jen got to skip those years and come in on the backside, but they had this beautiful friendship, and I just loved it. And, you know, one of the things that I, I think about my mom was she was pretty easy to love, too, and I think she was so easy to love because she just allowed herself to love others easily. She was not a perfect student of God's word, but she did know God tells us to love others, to love God, love others, and to give big grace, and maybe to a fault, my mom would extend too much grace to a lot of people, but she easily loved others. Not a bad trait for any of us to have. If you're gonna err on putting the Bible into practice, maybe love other people too much, not a bad thing to do. I, I think of Sue, my mother-in-law. Yeah, <laughs> She has totally destroyed all those stereotypes, the negative stereotypes that the sitcoms would make of mother-in-laws. Like Sue gives us no room for that. She is as sweet and kind and gentle and caring and loving and compassionate as could be. And she has loved her sons-in-law as though we were her own children. She had four daughters, and then those daughters began getting married. She had to learn to be a boy mama later in life. And let me tell you, her daughters are pretty close in age, and sons are pretty close in age, and we've done a lot of crazy, well, we'll just leave it, we've done a lot of crazy things together. And my mother-in-law has just learned to be a boy mama, and then she's been blessed. I think it's a blessing with many grandsons, and she's learned to be a uh, boy grandmama. And she has put up with a lot, and in the two and a half decades that my wife and I have been together, my mother-in-law has seen me at my best, but she's seen me at my worst, and she's seen me at some of my worst of the worst moments. And she prayed me through every single one of them. Tremendous grace. Prayers. She's a woman of prayer. Paul writes to the church and he says, pray unceasingly. Sue has shown me what that looks like. Conversations with Sue are just a birthplace of prayer. Uh, she is a woman of prayer and grace, of gentleness and humility. She, she has listened to Paul's words to the church and lives them. What a beautiful thing. I, I think of another gal named Sue. When Jen and I moved from seminary to the first church where we served together in that capacity, we moved into a small house in Springfield, Illinois. It was winter time, and Sue came across the street to introduce herself to us, to give us a gift. In that moment, we learned that her husband had passed many years earlier, and um, Sue just loved on us. She, she gave us a gift, and then she gave us one, one little bit of, uh, of invitation with some rule with it. She said, now, when the weather clears and your kids want to go to the park, you know, the park is right behind my house. It's kind of in my backyard. Don't go all the way around the block. That's, gonna, that's just too long. You just, you just bring those little ones right through my yard. My only rule is if I'm on the porch or I'm in the backyard, you, you just gotta say hi. Well, the weather cleared and we would go to the park and there were many days we never made it to the park. <laughs> on those days, Sue would teach our kids how to make cookies and how to make crafts. Oh my goodness, the crafts they could make. Sue had a whole basement full of a craft room and our daughters would spend hours down there with Grandma Sue. She taught them how to make cookies and scones and other good treats. She taught my wife how to make potato rolls, which if you've never had a potato roll, it might sound odd, but oh, praise God for Sue and the gift of food that she taught us. What a, what a blessing she was. Sue and I, we would chat. We would chat about God and we would chat about church. We would not always agree, but we'd always have fun and we had a deep respect for one another. We loved Sue and Sue loved us. And 
just that first moment where she initiated interaction with us, we felt more at home because Sue had warmed our home for us and her home was always open to us. I think of Mrs. Robinson. Mrs. Robinson was my high school junior year lit teacher, and she gave us an assignment. We had to watch a movie. The movie was Cool Hand Luke, and then we had to write a literary analysis, find a theme in that movie, a metaphorical theme, and trace it through the movie and write on that, and I had no clue which one of the themes. She gave us a list of themes, and Mrs. Robinson knew that I had begun going to church, but she was well aware, I'm sure, that I had yet to follow Jesus. (laughs) Those are two very different things. I was attending I did not yet look like it. And so Mrs. Robinson encouraged me to choose the Messiah theme and follow it through that movie, Cool Hand Luke. And I said, well, I'm still unsure about that. So she gave me Bible verses to read. And she began using a movie to get me into God's word. I began reading God's word, began reading these Bible passages. I'd have questions about it. So I'd go before class or sometimes during class, stay after class. It didn't hurt that Mrs. Robinson was kind of cute. But... The, you know, um, but I was asking her about the Bible, and she was teaching me God's word and teaching me to see God's word in places that I might not otherwise see it. And she was fueling my hunger to study God's word, fueling my hunger to move closer to Jesus. She was answering questions I had about life with God. Pretty sly for a public high school teacher to leverage her platform to invite me to move closer to Jesus. What a cool thing! grateful for Mrs. Robinson. I think of Mary Jane. Mary Jane was my speech pathologist when I got to sixth grade. I had a lot of trouble saying my R's and some of my L's that were in the center of words. And by the end of sixth grade, Mary Jane had worked some tremendous working in my life. I I was more confident I was improving quite a bit. My parents were afraid I was going to regress, though, and lose all that I had accomplished in that year. And so they asked Mary Jane if she would meet with me, give me special speech lessons during the summer. Every middle school kid's dream is go have a speech therapy session once a week in somebody's home. Oh, thanks, Mom and Dad. Summer's awesome. Woo. But I did, and Mary Jane, who had never done that, saw something in me and decided to give it a shot. She met with me once a week. I went to her house, and it worked. By the time seventh grade rolled around, I graduated. This shy kid who was always afraid to talk, even to just one other person, uh, who stored up all of his words because he didn't feel like he could share many of them. I'm making up for it now, aren't I? (laughs) Suddenly, I could speak. Suddenly, for the first time, I felt confidence in even saying my name, Andrew William Fitzgibbon. You can just call me Fitz, but suddenly I could say my address. For a kid who couldn't say his R's before, now I could say Rural Route 1, Sugar Creek Estates, Glen Arm, Illinois. And by the way, Glen Arm is what you would expect Glen Arm to be. Not a great place to grow up. Um, I could say my phone number with confidence, 483-4399. I still remember it to this day because I avoided it so much when I was a little kid who couldn't say his R's. No longer did I have to pretend that I had moved from Boston. Oh, look at the car parked over there. It's pretty far away, isn't it? No, now I could say like a good old Midwesterner, look at the car parked over there, pretty far away, isn't it? I mean, it's like I finally developed a good Midwestern accent. And I was so grateful for Mary Jane. This kid who was afraid to speak in front of people, now had confidence. And years later, when I was in seminary, being trained for ministry, I thought, I'm gonna call her up. I, I found her number, and I called Mary Jane, and I said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, and you know, let her know, hey, I used to be a high school teacher and a coach, and now I'm preaching in front of people, and sometimes there's a lot of people in the room, and I just wanna let you know that you helped give me that confidence, that shy little kid who couldn't speak to anybody now, speaks unashamedly to as many as he can to help steer them to the hope that only Jesus offers. I could hear her tenderness and joy on the other side of the phone as she told me that she's a woman of faith who was praying for me every week during that time. What a blessing it was all these years later to hear from me. Just a couple years later, Jen and I were at a church and in ministry and we had taken another couple out to dinner and and we were sharing dinner with this couple who become new friends of ours and 
came up in the conversation, my speech impediment when I was a kid, and then Jen shared that story of me reaching out to Mary Jane, and, and then our friend Amy got super excited. She said, you're the guy. You're the guy. My, my mom told us about this at Thanksgiving a couple years ago. Mary Jane is my mom. You have no idea how encouraging that was for her. You have no idea how the family celebrated. That was our Thanksgiving celebration was the phone call you made to my mom. I had no clue because the celebration was here for me, what she had done for me, to, to leverage her work for God's glory. I think the Bible says something about that. You know, when you came in today, you got a card like this. Hey, go ahead and pull that card out. Since I thank God every time I remember you, I, I'm sure as I've been sharing these stories, You've been thinking of your own. As I've talked through Paul's list and some of the people on my list, I'm sure you've been thinking of some of the people on your list. Why don't you go ahead and write down one of those names? And I know it's Mother's Day, and we've been talking mostly about gals. It doesn't have to be a gal. It could be a guy. I could talk about Brian and Mark and Steve and Brandon and on and on and Matt, and there's plenty of dudes. But you just, the, the name that came to you as I was talking, go ahead and write it down. And, and while you're at that, I'm, I'm guessing there's, another name that came to mind. You can use the, the pen from the seat back in front of you. Those of you joining us online, sorry, we didn't get your card. <laughs> you just use a piece of paper or use the note app on your phone or your computer. I don't know, open up a Word doc. Um, just go ahead and write a name down. And While you're at it, you probably had another name come to mind as well. You can go ahead and write that name too. And while you're writing that one, you, you're probably also thinking of a third or a fourth or a fifth. It, you just begin making your list. In fact, I'd encourage you to take some time even later today before, before your head hits the pillow and just jot down some names on that list. It doesn't have to be all of them. But, and then maybe in the days ahead, just reach out to one or two of those people. Let them know that they're on your list. Let them know the difference they've made for you. And, and and remember this, that that list, oh, it's, it's way more than a list, isn't it? Because if we don't follow Jesus in isolation, the, the Bible is not a, a book of just theological statements of do this, don't do that, statements stacked together. It's, it's the story of God at work in humanity to rescue humanity. It's God at work in his church, which is the people, a storied people whose stories intertwine and interact with one another. Celebrate those people whose stories have made your story maybe a bit better. That's what this is, right? I mean, that's what we celebrate. And maybe the, the best thing you can do for somebody is reach out and acknowledge that, hey, you're on a list because of the way you loved me or prayed for me or were hospitable to me or you invited me to follow Jesus because you modeled the faith for me because the things you read in the Bible I actually saw lived out in your life and that, that drew me towards Jesus not just towards you and, but, but perhaps maybe the best thing we could do is not just encourage those who are on our list but to invite other people to experience a list that they can thank God for to live in such a way that we would be on someone else's list and we would invite them not just to, to have us on their list but we would invite them into community we would invite them into our small group and invite them into our church and invite them to serve alongside us and invite them into our our quiet places, invite them to, to read the word alongside us, invite them to, to learn how to pray alongside us, and invite them to learn how to follow Jesus alongside us, and invite them to do that with other people in this community of faith so that we give them a list they can thank God for. Perhaps that's what this church thing is really all about when we think about it. Now, friends, I'm gonna take a moment and pray for us. And, and because it's Mother's Day, I wanna say a special prayer for those moms and those mom figures. If it sparks names on the list, it's okay for you to write on that list while we pray. But let's, let's go to God. And God, we thank you 
for our moms and those gals who are like moms to us. We thank you for all the people who would show up on our list that you've given us a list. And some people, their list is much longer than others. For those whose list isn't very long, I pray that they would find connection and community right here at OCC that you would use this church to lengthen their list. And God, that you would help all of us to live in such a way to be on others' lists. But as we think of the moms today, God, the truth is right now, we know that so few moms feel like a Hallmark card. They feel more like the gals in that video we saw earlier. So we lift up before you the moms. Not just the Hallmark card ones, but those with needs. We pray for young moms today, tired moms, harried and hurried moms who are unsure of whether they're doing it right, if they've got what it takes, the moms who are overwhelmed by the pace and the pressures of life, the moms who struggle to stay on top of depression. God, would you be their peace? Jesus, would you be their portion? We pray for the elderly moms whose days of raising their young children are long past, but whose hearts will never be far from their kids, no matter the age. Would you be a healing balm to them as they may feel some regret? God, would you help them to rejoice in the positive fruit of their labor and their prayers for their kids over the years? Father, we pray for the moms who work so hard without the support of a husband, those who are single or those who are married but still feel like a single parent. We pray for changes in their husbands. We pray that you will be the portion and the strength for those moms. We pray for the mothers whose husbands and sons have been called away to serve in armed forces. Would you be their confidence and their peace? We pray for the moms who struggle with finances every month, and we ask that you would take care of them and help them to provide the most important things for their kids, especially things that don't cost money, especially a model of faith. God, would you be their provision? We pray for mothers world over who struggle with having anything to feed their kids, moms who struggle with illnesses and sicknesses and addictions and diseases. God, would you bring healing and would you be their strength and their portion and their peace? We pray for moms everywhere who worry that that gene of love you gave them in their DNA, that natural compulsion to care for their kids has gone to the place where it hurts inside and they fixate and they fret God, would you be their peace? We pray for moms with special children who have special needs, for moms of wayward kids, of rebellious kids, of stubborn kids, of kids in trouble. God, would you be their portion and would you heal their hearts and would you give them hope? We pray, Lord, today for moms who feel guilty because they feel like a bad mom, like they've failed to provide what their families need. Would you release them from guilt, Lord? Turn them to you that their confidence may be in you. God, we pray for those women and young women who have become mothers with life inside their womb, but through unplanned or at unexpected times. God, we pray you would give them compassion for those babies and love for those babies and courage to act on behalf of those babies. And for those who have made unfortunate choices in the past, we pray that they would know and experience your forgiveness and your cleansing and they would be set free from that. God, would you be their strength, their portion, and their peace. We pray for moms who have opened their homes and their arms through adoption to welcome a child. We pray for those women whose hearts break today because they were never able to become a mom, to bear children. Women who longed for and prayed for children but whose arms remain empty on this day. Oh God, would you be their healing, their portion, and their peace. Forgive us, God, for the grief and the heartache we have brought to our moms. Help us to forgive our moms for whatever it is we feel they have done, for the ways they hurt us or failed us. And most of all, God, we thank you for our moms. We thank you for their love and their faithfulness, their tenderness, their nurture, their care, for showing us something of yourself through them. Thank you for the moms who bore us and fed us and nourished us, who taught us more than any school ever could, who through the years forgave us when we hurt and disappointed them, who believed in us even when we did not believe in ourselves, who were for us when it seemed no one else was. And Father, 
we thank you for showing us so much of yourself through the love, the care, the compassion, the steady faithfulness of our moms. And God, we thank you for your son. Your son who meted out grace and mercy to all of us who were undeserving. And you offer it freely and you invite all of us to find our hope, our life, our freedom, our forgiveness in you. God, thanks for loving us as you do. Thanks for the gifts of our mamas and for showing us your heart through them. God, we're grateful. And so we pray all of this in the powerful, resurrecting name of our rescuing King Jesus.